For the uninitiated, who exactly is Revival Cycles? Well, at the core, we're a group of guys passionate about design and working with our hands. We apply that passion through conceiving, planning, and fabricating physical projects on everything from motorcycles to audio equipment and everything in between. For 12 years now, we've been slaving away in a small workshop in Austin, Texas, educating ourselves and honing our skills. Over the years, we've become obsessed with sharing as much of that education as possible with our fans and collaborators. We've been lucky enough to develop a relationship with BMW Motorrad. A year ago, we were given their pre-production powertrain from a new model that they were about to launch. We were challenged with designing and building a motorcycle of our own around it. A few years ago, I took inspiration from the Ernst 10A bike of the 1920s and 30s. Ernst 10A built a land speed racing bike uh, to go try to set land speed records. To me, the Ernst 10A bike was probably the prettiest race bike ever built. Black with the beautiful gold wing bars and iconic black bodywork with a double white pinstripe and the triangle frame, uh, the way it came to the hardtail on the back. All those things just made this thing just really, really pretty. I'd seen the bike in person because it still exists and came home with the idea that we should build a bike kind of paying homage to that. Eventually, I got the team behind the vision I had for that. We built a bike we called the Henne Landspeeder, and it, I wouldn't say it went viral, but to a degree it made an impact in the, in the motorcycle custom scene. From there, it got the attention of BMW. BMW is a lead sponsor of the Handbelt Motorcycle Show and has been for a few years, and the design segment of BMW Corporate caught wind of this thing and saw photos of it. They approached us and asked, would you be interested in uh, building another motorcycle with a BMW platform for something that we're developing? It was like super top secret. No one was allowed to know about it. And they wouldn't even show us photos. They just hinted about something that was coming that we'd kind of touched on. Little did we know BMW was developing the newest iteration of an R opposed engine. Of course I said yes. They came back to us and said, okay, now we can start to talk about what this bike is. So. They flew me to Germany, they showed me the production bikes or the prototypes that they had designed and said, hey, we're gonna give you an engine, a gearbox and a differential. And you can design the motorcycle that you'd like to design around this. Just don't make it look like our production motorcycle. <laughs> that was the only rule, which is a pretty unique opportunity. It's given us access to these things before anybody else gets to see it. Uh, before their imagination gets to kind of go crazy on it, uh, we get to first run this thing. For me as a designer, most certainly that's the dream. That's the reason I got into this business to begin with was the idea that we could do something different and unique. So we get this big head start. They send us this engine and gearbox in our end. We had some CAD files to go on. We had some basic structures, the mechanics, but for the most part, we're just sketching on a piece of paper out the idea of what we might do. Because BMW commissioned this bike, they're not interested in me deciding to re-engineer an entirely new motorcycle that's better than theirs. The idea and the only goal of this motorcycle is to make something that, that peels in a design perspective different from what they've done. So the decision was made that we would build a motorcycle that was somewhat inspired by the Ernst 10A bike, which of course our first Henne bike had been inspired by. I uh, needed to pay homage to that, but in a completely different way. Is this motorcycle been built to uh, ride 400 miles a day on a highway? No, it's built only to go racing. It doesn't have a single light on it. I take that back. It's got one light, but it's only the light that tells us the thing's on so we don't leave it on. It's not made for comfort. It's not a couch on wheels. It's not a big cruiser motorcycle. It's built for one thing, and that has to be ridden for just a minute or two at a time, and it's fast as it'll go. And of course, it's built to look otherworldly. That was the whole idea. The only task BMW had outside of us designing a motorcycle that wasn't like the first bike was that it needed to make the engine the center of focal point of what we did. And to me, that's a pretty big challenge, right? To me, when you design something, it has to have at least one 
driving force that everything else is kind of designed around. You can't just build a standard frame that looks like every other frame that's out there. It has to be something different, right? And it certainly can't look like the factory frame. So what if we build this so that it looks like the engine is just kind of hanging out in the middle of the room and just between two wheels and it creates a, an optical illusion. I had that mocked up on a bench and I had the idea that maybe we would build a frame that was inspired by the vintage Porsche 917 and the Maserati birdcage. And it kind of started from there. The inspiration for the birdcage frame came directly from the Maserati birdcage race cars from the 50s and 60s. We had already decided on the proportions, really. All I really had was engine gearbox and rear end and the wheels and tires that we had chosen. I built a mock-up frame using welding wire probably three different times I did some basic structures and took advantage of the material. Next day the guys came into the shop, saw what I'd started to create with the welding wire and everybody liked it, it to my surprise. I didn't expect that part, but they liked it. So we started moving forward. The principle to me was to obviously make sure that it's strong enough to work and function, but look like it doesn't. So that's kind of a careful balance. The triangulation with any material makes it exponentially stronger. And we estimate about 40% of the tubing that's on the motorcycle is not actually necessary. The rest of it's just there to hold everything together. From there, we started adding pieces of titanium. I should say I did. I said that I liked a piece here, I liked a piece there. Those were strictly aesthetic choices that obviously add some rigidity and make the frame even stronger, but aren't even necessary for the bike to work. And now sometimes because of the response we've gotten from the public, where people think it looks fragile and like it would never stay together, I kind of wish we'd built it with fewer pieces because then it would look even more ridiculous. The frame on this motorcycle is very, very asymmetrical. There are very few pieces on this that are centered and, and even all the way across. From a distance, it looks like it might be just straight through, but it's not. Every single piece is in a different orientation from the other side, front to back, left to right. It's been said that perhaps I'm an asymmetrical person. In fact, uh, I wear it all over my face. Maybe there is some parallel between how uneven I am as a person or as a designer and <laughs> what this bike is ultimately. Everything's asymmetrical. The cylinders are opposed, but they're offset a little bit because of the crankshaft design. The gearbox output shaft goes down one side. The rear differential is on one side, and, and that means everything's weighted towards the right-hand side of the motorcycle. So the only thing you can build symmetrically or design into it, when I was looking at it, was that center line that comes from the top neck down to the center of the, of the engine. So every other piece is kind of informed by that, but then more logically, it starts to come towards the rear differential as a strong point that needs to be supported. Because of the unique structure of the decision to go with the Detali front suspension, I was able to tack on to frame points at a higher point that didn't require going all the way down below the engine, a la the birdcage frame was kind of born. We chose titanium specifically because of its lightweight principle. What I wanted to do was build a structure that used a lot of different pieces. Now, if we'd done this in steel, that frame might weigh 150 pounds. But because we did it in titanium, it weighs less than 30. 20% of the weight of steel uh, with all of the strength. It's hard, much harder than it would be if it were aluminum. Titanium has this beautiful natural color when you get it hot. It changes from blue to purple to green. I like the beauty of the natural surface altogether. Working with titanium presents its own set of absolute challenges. Welding titanium isn't much fun because you've got to shield it from the oxygen and the contaminants in the air. Our kind of best welder in the house had never even welded titanium before, so this is a challenge. It will flex uh, and it's brittle. Now, that can be a problem if, say, we thought we were gonna put two, 3,000 miles on this motorcycle. The welds could be an issue. You end up with some cracking from all the vibrations and all the different forces being put on it. I don't foresee that happening at all this bike ever because it will probably only get a few dozen miles on it at most, which is perfectly okay because we didn't build it to be a, a long touring motorcycle. We built it to be strong for this, this short amount of time. It's engineered with purpose. 
all the fasteners and pieces that you attach the frame to have to be titanium because you can't weld titanium to regular steel or aluminum. So now we've got to machine all the parts out of titanium that are attachment points to the engine. You machine all those parts specifically out of that same material uh, is also uh, much harder than if we'd done it with aluminum or another type of alloy. It's definitely not as straightforward as some of the other materials we work with. One of the things that was suggested to me by Auerbach, uh, who is the lead engineer at Revival, was that we use the telelever suspension. That idea came out when we were just going to do the supercharger, and it was just kind of an interesting homage to BMW's technological innovations regardless, and it was one that we weren't going to tell BMW about because we didn't want them to tell us we couldn't do it. <laughs> Because of the telelever suspension, a good portion of the forces involved are actually transferred directly to the engine and to the one shock. If you look at the front end of the bike, it's a mountain bike shock. That should give you some clue as to how little force is actually being put into the frame, right? We're not talking about a lot of force involved here. Because of the way the swing arm is shaped, you've got a fulcrum point at a, at a different section so that the force is there, but it's, it's just not gonna be enough. So the other design choice that we made outside of the titanium was Chris Davis and I went looking for uh, old school hot rod uh, fuel injection throttle bodies to put on this thing. Just kind of hanging out there off to the side, your knees in behind them, it screamed hot rod. And why not try to do that? I really like the old style Hilburn uh, mechanical fuel injection that we used to see on drag cars. They were normally alcohol, direct injected uh, valve bodies, a la what's on the damn motorcycle. The public reaction to this has been lots of questions. From the day we revealed the bike, people said, where's the fuel tank? It doesn't have any fuel lines. Uh, how can it function and how can it run? Simply put, we just painted the fuel tank black. It's only a gallon because it didn't need to be more. And the fuel lines that go to fuel injectors are cloth black. So they're tough to see, but they're there and they were there from day one. And of course, the valve bodies that are sticking out from the sides of the motor, all they really do is meter air. And all the fuel comes into the engine via direct injection into the cylinder head. We put a fuel pump inside the fuel tank, and then we control that all with a custom ECU standalone unit that we had to reverse engineer what BMW put on the motor and make it all talk to this custom computer. Measuring air and fuel ratios is what a fueling system does. Getting throttle bodies and direct injection to jibe perfectly is really difficult. Through dyno testing and quite a bit of work, we managed to make the damn thing run. So it runs well, and it's got a lot of torque and a lot of power. We didn't just go with a standard foot shift and a standard brake and all the other things that you're kind of limited to. The compromise of engineering and rideability was also not a problem of ours. We're just looking at it from a design perspective and what it is I kind of personally like. So you look at the bike, you've got regular twist throttle with your right hand and you've got a left side clutch and then you've got a right side hand shifter. You've got a rear brake with your left foot because I liked where that was placed. I wanted it all to be on that side. It's nothing more than that because that brake will probably hardly ever get used. We didn't even put a front brake on it because it's not necessary. Motorcycles at one time were made without front brakes. <laughs> that's just kind of a common thing. Now, if I was gonna take this thing into traffic, that'd be kind of an issue. But for this, this exercise, it's perfect. It's got a rear disc brake with a component that some people didn't even notice. It's a custom rear brake caliper that we designed and built. It's not even been on another motorcycle before. It's kind of tucked in on the left side. The back battery and all the wiring sits underneath the engine cover down low and down there we've got a plug where we plug in a wire that comes up and attaches to the handlebar where you turn the system on and then you reach down you hit the starter button and it starts. Nothing more to it than that. Because it's fuel injection you don't need to have your hand on the throttle. It modulates itself. It turns itself off and on uh, and it runs great. That's it. it. There's nothing else that controls this bike.
One cool thing I like about the bike is the seat. We've used two flexible materials, the carbon fiber, that's thin and very lightweight, but also flexible, and just two pieces of titanium that are cantilevered out for that specific reason are flexible. So if you hit a bump on the motorcycle, this part acts like a spring so that you don't feel it as much in your butt or on the part of you that's touching the seat. So as a designer, and even as an engineering and fabrication team, you try to plan out for every single challenge that's coming further down the road. So this isn't checkers, this is chess. You're thinking 15 steps further down the line of the challenges that the decisions you're making now will affect the ability to complete and have something function further down the road. No matter how many years we've been doing this or how much better at this we're getting, it's still a huge challenge. So you start off with one piece and that might be that that backbone line, it might have been the configuration and the proportions that we decided on when we first started. And you try to think through every single piece and how it's going to affect the, the later pieces. Unfortunately, there's no other way to get around it. It's just gonna be a challenge. You're setting up challenges for yourself. It's how you mitigate those challenges further down the road that gets you complete and done. Unfortunately, we only had six weeks to build the motorcycle and that was to finish all final design and build a bike to release at the handbuilt show. Uh, that's not straightforward, as many pieces as there are. All these things require CAD files, require custom machining, require probably three, four thousand dollars worth of just metal alone, and we kind of went to it. We worked uh, seven days a week, seven people for six weeks to finish the motorcycle. I mean, we're just some normal guys that decided we wanted to build custom motorcycles and that maybe we could do it. Every time we've built something, we've tried to do a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit more challenging. And every time we step up to that plate and, and kind of at least achieve that it's something new and something better for us, I'm happy. I've said this many times, what makes a great mechanic and maybe perhaps a great fabricator and maybe even a great designer his stubbornness, his unwillingness to give up and quit is to just keep pushing forward. There are harder things done in the world than building this custom motorcycle, but for us as an exercise and kind of fun, uh, creative energy, maybe even a futility, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun to try to finish and get the damn thing going. For me as a designer, without a doubt, this project is kind of the dream. The idea that someone's going to give you a budget, give you a motorcycle uh, that no one else has seen before, and let you just kind of go creatively wild with it for a bit. It's, it's everything. Is the reason I'm a designer. Hopefully it goes further from here getting to play with things that are only driven by your imagination is a huge win and really, really fun. The end result is I think BMW liked the motorcycle. They were certainly taken aback when they got to see it because it isn't a, at all what they expected to see. But then again, that wasn't the goal from my perspective regardless. It was to build something that no one expected to see. One of the heads from BMW saw the motorcycle and I thought he was crying. So I think that was a good thing. For me, the initiative of building the motorcycle was to profile this engine that was cool and huge and beautiful. And we did exactly that, because if you look at it from one perspective, all you see is engine and it just looks like it's floating and that's perfect. And I think BMW loved that. So I think when you design or build anything, it's not for everyone. We didn't design this bike for anybody but BMW and us, period. Generally, the reception of the bike has been really positive. 99% of people just love it because they know what it was built for. It wasn't built to be a competition with a Honda Goldwing or a BMW K-Bike. 
with a couch and a stereo and a GPS system. This thing was built to, to pay homage to something that was a simpler time in the 20s and 30s using more modern techniques. I wouldn't say there's been haters on the internet, but there's certainly been people that have asked like, wow, how comfortable is that gonna be after a 400 mile day? Or, uh, uh, wow, there's no way it runs. There's no way it functions. Well, that was the goal to begin with. For me personally, it was to build a motorcycle that didn't look like it runs, but it runs and it rides, and it rides really damn well considering what we built it for. It's really damn loud. It gets the attention of anybody that's around. It's certainly not street legal, uh, but it wasn't meant to be street legal. So therefore, we're not too concerned about 400 mile rides. Personally, I'm really satisfied with the project. You know, the ergonomics, we could really work on the cup holder. <laughs> it's kind of the first motorcycle uh, that I've ever had to take full responsibility for that Revival's ever done. I'm proud to say that we built the damn thing. And I'm really proud to say that the team came together uh, and took a creative vision and initiative that I had and turned it into something even better than I could have ever done alone.